great to be with you again. We have uh, four really fabulous scripture passages to be able to look at. Today, the first reading is from Isaiah chapter 45. Now, I mentioned on the study guide that probably most Bible scholars believe that Isaiah's chapters 1 through 39 were written in the mid-700s B.C. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet to the south at the time of the fall of the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes. And then from Isaiah 40 and following, this was written maybe a couple hundred years later in the mid-500s B.C., near the end of the time of the Babylonian captivity. There is a change in tone and emphasis beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. I'm sure that you'll recognize the words as the uh, opening aria in the Handel's Messiah. You know, comfort ye my people, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is ended, her penalty is paid, and she is received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. The word of comfort, because the time of the Babylonian captivity is just about at an end. Now, at the end of 2 Chronicles, we have basically word for word the same account as the beginning of the next book, the book of Ezra, which leads a lot of people to believe that Ezra, the man who rebuilt the law community after the exile, was the author of Chronicles as well as Ezra. The uh, Babylonians were defeated, destroyed by the Persians. And so uh, the Cyrus, the king of Persia, is talked about here that the Lord stirred up his spirit so that he sent a herald throughout all the kingdom and declared, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And now those who would like to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, may the Lord be with you and go. So that Cyrus, the uh, Persian conqueror, was the one who then allowed the Jewish people to be able to return to their homeland and rebuild the temple. And um, I think this would have been totally irrelevant in the mid-700s B.C., so, but it really speaks powerfully to the people in the 500s B.C. This must have been absolutely astounding for them to hear this pagan conquering emperor being spoken of and being declared to be God's anointed or God's chosen. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, this pagan emperor is God's instrument of accomplishing his purpose. His purpose is chosen to subdue nations, strip kings, open doors. This must have been absolutely astounding to the people to hear Cyrus being spoken of in these terms. And yet Cyrus is the one that God used in order to enable his people to return. God says, I will go before you. I will break in pieces what resists you. I will give you treasures so that you may know that I am the one who call you by name. And I'm doing this for the sake of my people, Israel. And then it's remarkable in verses 4 and 5. I name you though you do not know me. I arm you though you do not know me. That per, uh, Cyrus didn't know the God of Israel. And yet he was the one that God was using in order to accomplish his purpose. Must have been just amazing to the people to hear Cyrus being, not only how overjoyed they were over what Cyrus was allowing them to do, but that God would speak of a pagan emperor in these terms. Uh, Luke 2.1, another example. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered for taxation. It was because of a decree by a pagan emperor that Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem at the time when Jesus was born in order to fulfill Old uh, Testament prophecy. And so here it's because of Caesar's wanting to collect taxes that God's will and God's, uh, the prophet's prediction came fulfilled. So do you believe that God can work even through unbelieving political powers today? Martin Luther talked about the, the two kingdoms, the kingdom on the right, God works through the church in order to share the gospel to bring people to salvation. God also works through government, the kingdom on the left, in order to maintain law and order, in order to make life be livable. And so I think here is an example of uh, God's working through uh, Cyrus the Persian conqueror in order to accomplish his will, so God calling him his anointed. 
you can see why this would have been the first reading on the Sunday when the gospel is about, you know, giving to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Uh, God has established the system of government in order to maintain order, in order to accomplish his will in the world and to make life livable. So, Psalm 96, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Now, how do you feel about learning new songs? I remember back in the late 70s, we had a music director who selected the hymns who was constantly picking out unfamiliar hymns that went with the theme of the day, but nobody could sing. And so our church at the time went through a long-range planning process. People and groups were invited to, to, uh, to share what their goals were for one, five, and 10 years. It is interesting for the congregation, the top goals were to build a new sanctuary and fellowship hall, and then to sing more familiar hymns. So those we didn't, a lot of people didn't like to sing new songs. I remember the men's prayer breakfast group, men's prayer Bible study. Their two main goals were to gain new members and to stay the same. I thought that's probably the, <laughs> of most congregations, gain new members and stay the same, but this group actually verbalized it as such. So, uh, how do you feel about learning new songs? You know, sometimes my experience with the God is such where, where, where the, none of the words of the old songs, the songs I'm familiar with, really do. And so I also need a new song. Tell of his salvation from day to day. How often do you tell of God's salvation? How often does the average Lutheran tell of God's salvation? Tragically, not too often. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. What glory is God due? Does he deserve? And if so, are you doing it? And how are you doing it? <clears throat> Verses 11 and following. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar. Let the field exult. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy. Now, I have a feeling in the Sonoran Desert now, if the plants were to say anything, they probably would say, I am thirsty. But here, creation is described as praising God. That reminds me of Luke 1940, when the <clears throat> religious leaders were all uptight about the people welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And, G and they said, Jesus, make your disciples stop. They're, they're creating too much of a ruckus and the Romans might get nervous and things may not turn out well. And Jesus says, well, I tell you, if they are silent, the stones will cry out. If the stones had done that, that would have been an example of the world's what? First rock concert. You know, I don't want a bunch of stones to have to praise God to do what I should be doing. And so I want to join with the sea, the fields, the forests, and the rocks in praising God. Okay, <clears throat> beautiful a statement of all creation praising God. <clears throat> and if creation praises God, I certainly want to praise him <clears throat> as well. Let's now look at uh, uh, Paul's letter to first, first letter to the Thessalonians. This is a church in northern Greece that uh, Paul had, uh, where Paul had gone on his second missionary journey, the city of Thessalonica. <clears throat> He starts out <clears throat> by telling who is writing. When we write a letter, uh, we give our name at the end of the letter. At this particular time, when you write a letter, you give your name right at the beginning, and so people know exactly who it is from. Philip Brooks is the man who um, wrote prize most famous as the author of the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And uh, he was having kind of a cantankerous congregation, and he's, one time there was someone who wrote him a letter and just had one word in it, fool. And so the following Sunday he said, well, you know, I've received lots of letters where people wrote a letter and did not sign their name. But this is the first time I got a letter where somebody signed their name but did not write the letter. But here we have who it's from right at the beginning, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. I think it's interesting here that instead of using the more Jewish form of Silas's name, Silas, they use a more Latin, Romanized form, Silvanus. Again, probably reflecting the culture, the Greek Roman culture of the city, uh, the church to whom they were writing. Grace to you and peace. 
This is typical Paul's way of saying things. Because of God's grace, uh, we can have peace in our relationship with him. There really is a connection between them. I can know where I stand with God and have peace because of his grace. Another way in which Paul always talks is in verse 2. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention in our prayers. I mentioned there in Philippians 1 where he uses the same kind of welcome. This is just kind of Paul's way of saying things. He just had his way of talking. Uh, Terry says, I've used this illustration too many times, but she said I could use it again. She was leading a, a women's Bible study, and uh, she asked me what I would say about a particular passage. And I said, well, I'd say this and this and this and this and this. She said, well, I can't say that. And I says, well, why not? And she said, because it would sound like you. I says, well, what's wrong with that? Well, you know, we all kind of have our way of talking, and Paul had his way of saying things. Always give thanks to God for you and mention in our prayers. Constantly remembering before God. Now here it's interesting. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said, So abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. Another way that he often talked was in terms of those three. Faith, hope, and love. So he says, I'm constantly remembering before God your work of faith, your labor of love, and the steadfastness of your hope. Again, faith, hope, and love, those three things that Paul emphasized. Now, it's interesting when he writes his second letter to them, the church was kind of getting a little bit messed up on their uh, understanding of the second coming. And so they were kind of messed up on, their, on, on that. And so it's interesting there, he, for he commends him for their faith, which is growing, their love, which is increasing, but he does not mention their hope. It's kind of interesting. Our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power. I, I just was thinking about that phrase there, that how is the mess, how are we experiencing the message of the gospel as not just words, but also power? Think of a time when you just really experienced in your life the power of the message of the gospel. Maybe it was a word of forgiveness. Maybe it was a word of hope. Maybe it was a word of God's love. When have you experienced the message of the gospel in, in just a powerful, powerful way? Verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. That reminds me of some passages in Philippians where Paul says in 2.5, have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus, be like Jesus. In 3.17, I know you need a human example to follow, so he says, join in imitating me. And then in 4.9, which you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, I try, I've tried very hard to be a good example for you to follow. And then he says to the Philippians, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia, northern Greece, and Achaia in southern Greece. When Paul writes his second letter to the Corinthians, and he's trying to gather an offering for the starving Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And he says to them, he tells them about the churches in Macedonia up in the north, which would be Philippi and Thessalonica, and how in spite of their severe affliction of their situation, they gave according to their means and even beyond their means. Same thing, that you provide an example for the believers. Verse 9. The people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you. We were welcomed. And yet if you read in Acts 17, it's interesting what actually happened. Paul was, he was welcomed by the people and by the people who turned to Christ. But it's interesting when he was in Thessalonica, he was only able to be there for three weeks before he got driven out of town. And then he went to the city of Berea. And the people who opposed him were not content with just driving him out of Thessalonica. They went to Berea and caused raucous there. You know somebody doesn't like you if they even follow you to the next place and cause chaos for you there. And so he was welcomed by those who came to Christ and yet strongly opposed by others. And so was there for only a short time. It's interesting what he was accused of doing. <clears throat> Uh, the people who were all upset at him 
said, these people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also. One thing I've learned about people is they do not like having their world turned upside down. And so that's what they were accusing Paul of. That's just kind of an interesting phrase. When have you felt that something was just turning your world upside down? Certainly the pandemic has turned our world upside down. Whoever thought in the middle of March that it was still going on with such intensity now seven months later. Well, let's now turn to our gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 22. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, we all know that it's still a long time until tax day, April 15. It's uh, six months. And so I don't want to bring up something that's kind of an unpleasant thought. But it's interesting that April 15 is not only tax day, it's also the day that the Titanic sank. It ran into the iceberg late in the evening of April 14 and sank on April 15. It's also the day that Abraham Lincoln was shot on April 15. I remember having a particularly bad, one of those terrible meetings, and someone said to me at the end of the meeting, well, Mrs. Lincoln, other than that, how did you enjoy the play? Well, you see, April 15 is just kind of a bad day all the way around. A cynic once wrote, <clears throat> death and taxes may always be with us, but at least death does not get worse every time that Congress meets. Arthur Godfrey once said, I really do feel honored to be able to live in America and feel taxes and pay taxes in America. It's just that I could feel equally as honored at, I wish I could feel just as honored at half the price. Another person said, the Eiffel Tower is the Empire State Building after taxes. Now the truth of the matter is that people do not enjoy paying taxes. I don't like taxes. You, I'm sure, don't like ta paying taxes. And people in Jesus' day didn't like to pay taxes either. The problem was even worse because they were paying taxes to a hated, occupying foreign power, the Romans, whom they despised. A good portion of their income always ended up in Caesar's pocket, and that made them very, very unhappy. They resented Roman domination. And so that's the uh, context when the Pharisees and the Herodians, uh, two Jewish religious groups that normally hated each other, but they had a common enemy in Jesus, and they thought that they had come up finally with a question where they could catch Jesus. And you could just see the delight on their faces as they scurried to where Jesus was because they had come up with the ideal question to be able to ask him in order to catch him. I remember when I was serving a church and uh, pastor of a church in Southern California, there was uh, one member of the church that was always trying to catch me at something. And he would invite me out to lunch. Well, I was always a good guy and accepted his invitation to lunch. We talk about different things and then he would get a smirk on his face and then he would start tapping his fingers on the table. And I knew that that's when the question was coming that he was hoping to catch me on. That was the real reason for the meeting. And so the Pharisees and Herodians thought, we have come up with an answer. We, we finally will be able to catch Jesus. <clears throat> Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? If Jesus offends the Jews, then um, if, he, if he says you should pay taxes, then he'll offend the Jews and get them all upset. If he says not to pay taxes, the Jews will like it, but then the Romans will be all upset. So we've got him either way, they thought. Well, Jesus is not only the ruler of wind and waves, Jesus is also the master of every situation, and it's brilliant the way that he handled it. He was not one of these people that didn't answer the question, as we've seen can happen in debates. Instead, he answered the question. And so he asked for a coin. He says, whose image and title are on the coin? They said, Caesar's. He says, well, give back to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and give back to God the things that are, belong to God. And that was an absolutely, incredibly brilliant, irrefutable answer. And so it raises the question, we know the things that belong to Caesar. What are those things? And also, what are the things that belong to God? Now, one time there was a little boy that wanted $100 very badly. 
He prayed to God for a full week for $100, but did not get $100. Nothing happened. And so finally he wrote a letter to God asking for the $100, and he sent that letter through the post office. Well, when the post office got the letter addressed to God, they forwarded it to the White House. The president was very impressed, and so he instructed one of his aides to send the boy $5. He thought, figured $5 would mean a lot to the boy, which it did. Well, the boy, after getting the $5, sat down and wrote a note saying, Dear God, thank you so much for sending the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you sent it through Washington, and as usual, they kept most of it. Now, most of us accept the fact that in terms of giving to Caesar, we actually have very, very little choice. What Caesar wants, Caesar gets. And so we have learned we have to do it. But for many people, giving back to God the things that belong to God is a huge problem. And so in consideration of the gospel reading for this coming Sunday, I'd like to ask the question, why do we give? Why do we give back to God the things that are God's and in so doing provide financial support for the ministry of his church? Well, I can think of three reasons. First, we give back to God the things that belong to God in response to all the things that God has done for us. Now, times are tough. We know times are really, really tough. A lot of people no longer have regular income. A lot of people are concerned about how much longer they'll have regular income. What if the uh, uh, stimulus package isn't approved? A lot of people who are retired wonder, what kind of effect are all these dynamics going to have upon my assets? And yet we realize that if we compare how we live today and all the conveniences that we have today with the way in which people lived 100 years ago or the way in which most people live around the world today, we really do have a good. Financially, times are tough, but you still have your health. You have people who love you. Do you have food to eat and do you have a warm bed to sleep in? Do you believe that Jesus offers forgiveness of sins? Do you have a home in heaven waiting for you? The truth is that we all have so much to give thanks for. Thanks for. And so we first give to God the things that belong to God in response to all the things that God has done for us. Second, we give to God the things that belong to God as a remedy to the enslaving power of wealth. Now, the fly that has become the world's most famous fly reminds me of the story of the fly that landed on the flypaper and said, my flypaper. But the flypaper said, my fly. You see, there comes a time where every single one of us has to decide what role money is going to play in our lives. Will we have money or will money have us? It's really interesting that as people's income grows, the amount proportionally that they give to charity declines. The more people earn, the less proportionately they give, studies have found. You think it would work the other way around. The more I earn or the more I have, the more discretionary income and resources I have, so the more I should be able to give. And yet that's not how it works, studies have shown. Studies show that people with incomes below $50,000 a year give proportionally twice as much as people with incomes of between $100,000 and $200,000 a year. And we all know why. Instead of the fly having the flypaper, the flypaper as the fly. Many people who used to worship God worship money instead. It's happening all around us. There was a wealthy TV evangelist who was dying in his mansion. And he gathered his, his flock around him to hear his last dying wish. He said, before I die, I would like to take one last ride. They asked him what he would need for his long one last ride before entering into the kingdom of heaven. And he said, I would like a very small camel and a very large needle. You see, it's happening to people all around us. No one is, is immune. And so we give to God the things that belong to God as a remedy to the enslaving powers of wealth. And third, 
We give to God the things that belong to God as a reminder of who owns it all and who is number one in our lives. According to the Bible, the whole purpose of tithing, of returning to God 10% of what we earn or have, is to teach us who owns it all, who gave it all, and to whom we are accountable. You know, it's simply a matter of doing what Jesus said. Give back to God the things that belong to God. Seek first his kingdom, and then trust him to provide for and to take care of you. You know, we really don't have any choice when it comes to paying taxes. Maybe that's ultimately why we just accept it, though we dread April 15. But, and we may be willing to give a few tokens to God, but to place, place them first, to give at least a tithe, to give him our lives. The hymn says, Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet, this treasure store. Take myself and I will be always only all for thee. You see, God is the one who owns it all and has entrusted everything that we have to us. But he's the owner. God wants and deserves our first and our best. He owns it. We just have it on loan. And so my hope and prayer for you is that you will ask yourself, am I truly giving back to God the things that belong to God? And the Holy Spirit will be so active in your life that you will find giving back to God easier, more important, and more joyous than giving back to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar's. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we will be good stewards of all the blessings that you have entrusted to us. We pray that we will trust you and that you, we will place you first in our lives. We thank you for this amazing account of how you even worked through the pagan conquering emperor Cyrus in order to accomplish your will. And we believe that you can accomplish your world and our your will and our world today. We pray for peace and order and, and, and life for people. We pray for those that are in chaotic situations. We pray that in living in chaos, living in danger, we pray that rulers of the world will act as your, your servants in order to make life uh, go well for people. We pray that we will praise you with a new song. We will extol your greatness. We will join with creation in praising you. And we pray that, that as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, so also we will give thanks for those who have been an example for us of living the Christian life. We thank you for these scriptures, and we pray that we will be faithful in giving to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and also to God the things that belong to God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.